Hello there. Well, my hectic career has included three Formula One World Championships, a best-selling trilogy, and 25 years in network television. But then I walked away from it all for a quieter life. I'm Steve Matchett, kind of retired. Join me, won't you? Also, thank you very much for inviting me down to Euro Prestige Imports. It's an absolute pleasure and honor to share with you my latest purchase, which is the 1942 Ford GPW Jeep, a Second World War Jeep. Steve, that's a mouthful. Uh, my gosh, there's so many cool things that we need to go over this vehicle. Yeah. Uh, your passion for this vehicle has got me super excited. As a kid, I've only seen this in posters and maybe even magazines lately, but seeing it in real life here in this shape with your knowledge. It's a beautiful design. Um, and really that's one thing that, that impresses me with what your guys are doing here down at Euro Prestige Imports is that idea of car culture and passion doesn't merely have to be represented by Ferrari and Porsche and Lamborghini. Right, it's, right. It's passion of design. Yeah, yeah. To me it is. No, yeah, and, absolutely. Uh, I think this represents that in many ways. So it's an iconic shape, um, an iconic vehicle. It was Da Vinci that said really that simplicity is the art of, uh, of sophistication. Something doesn't have to be complicated for it to be sophisticated. It just has to work well, well. Yeah. It has to be designed well. So before the outbreak of the Second World War in the late 30s, the government were looking to produce a military vehicle that they could put uh, combat soldiers in and equipment and a vehicle that would go almost anywhere. They'd learned that from the lessons of the First World War. And if you think back to how the First World War was conducted, it was an artillery war. It was trench warfare and the two opposing sides were permanently in trenches, unable to move. It's very difficult to make an advance one way or the other because everybody was just permanently encased in mud all the time. And so the lessons of the First World War taught the, the, the Pentagon in this case that we need to have mobility. We've got to get the troops mobile. Willys had the design for this vehicle and it was known as the M. A, Willys MA, which was the prototype version. Oh, okay, okay. You've probably heard of the MB, the Willys MB, which came after it, right? So this is fundamentally that design. So Willys tweaked the design a little bit to appease Uncle Sam, changed some of the features on it, and they produced what was known as the Willys MB. But Willys was such a small concern that when the war effort needed to be ramped up and it became clear to the government fairly early on in the early 1940-41 period that this was going to be a world war conflict. We need a lot more product than Willys are capable of producing. Uncle Sam went to Ford and said, hey, you didn't win the contract that we gave that to Willys in terms of design, but we need your help. Can you produce fundamentally the same vehicle that Willys are producing? We need a lot more of it and Ford were, were happy to oblige, great contract, good government contract, and so Ford said, absolutely. Now, here's one reason why this Jeep is different to many other GPW, Ford GPWs. This is one you of the tell, yeah. very early examples that was made. This is a 1942 GPW. And when Ford said, yes, we can do this, we'll make those Jeeps exactly the same as Willys, no problem. We have one problem though, however, right now, we don't have a frame ready. We can produce the rest of the body work and we can okay. produce the engine and everything else very quickly, but we don't have the frame. Uncle Sam said, go to Willys and use Willys frames until you get your own. Now, there are a couple of visual cue differences between a Willys frame and a Ford frame. Okay. And I'll show you what that is here. If you look at the, the cross section on this tube here, oh, okay. the strength, and you can see that it is round in shape. It is not square. Oh, it's a and tubular, that, right? Yes, it's tubular. And that was a Willys design. This when, is their frame, essentially. Absolutely. So when Ford made their frame, they made it in a box section shape, very similar shape to this that you see here. Okay, around like the rest this of the guy here. Okay. It would be an easier, simpler process to do that. Right. But but Ford didn't have the frame. So this is a, a Jeep that's built, a Ford Jeep that's built on a Willys frame. A couple of things that give that away. One, you just mentioned it there. You're right, absolutely right. The tubular section of that cross member here. And also, down inside the gusset here where the, where the front bumper is, you'll notice there's a couple of little holes here. Oh yeah, there's like two rivet holes. Yes, and that would have been used to hold the Willys frame number identification plate. That was, oh. a, that was a Willys feature. But Ford 
didn't do that. Ford like to stamp their identification numbers on the frame, on the top, using number and letter stamps. Okay, okay. So this, to be correct, this particular Jeep, which is known as the Ford Script Jeep, and we'll talk about the Ford Script on the back in a little while, should have this Willys frame without the Willys identification plate, but with the Ford stampings on the top, which is correct. So if you knew just a little bit about Jeeps, but weren't right. too sure, it would be easy to look at this and say, hang on, what's going on? We can see that this is a Ford Jeep, but it's on a Willys frame. Those two things don't work together. What's going wrong? But that's absolutely correct. Early production for GPWs would have a Willys frame. That will make it correct. Let's go to the back of the Jeep and show I'll me. show you. This is what's known as the Ford Script Jeep. And it's called that because... Oh yeah, I saw this when we first... There it is. It. I was so confused being that I don't know anything about this. When I see a Jeep with a Ford stamping, yeah. big question marks come up. Again, not knowing the history behind this, right. it's crucial. Yeah, so this was the start of the Jeep legend, but it started with Ford and Willys. They produced the Jeep. And there are several possible reasons why the name Jeep ever came to the fore. Perhaps from GP general purpose, for example. Oh, okay. Or government project. Whichever way you want to look at it, those two letters seem to get sort of amalgamated together and became G. It's one reason. It seems to be lost in the mists of time exactly why G became G. Okay. But that's a couple of reasons perhaps why that is the case. So when Ford produced their G, they put their logo on the back. Why would they not do that? And Willys did exactly the same. The Willys Jeep, if you have a look at a Willys Jeep, has Willys on the back as well. Now, that went on into 42 until Uncle Sam knocked on the door of both of these manufacturers and said, stop this. <laughs> You're making these Jeeps for us. It's a government contract. You're making military hardware. It's not, it's not a commercial venture. Yeah. Take it off. Did it make a difference? Yeah. I don't know. When, if we were to lay the screen down, you would have a very low profile. Okay. And that was important because they wanted this Jeep to effectively disappear when it was in the countryside so that enemy troops couldn't spot it. Oh, there's no right? glare, there's no reflection. So also, yes, you're exactly right. One of the big big disadvantages of having glass was the glare because as we know, when you're, when you're on a desert island and you're trying to attract attention, you use a mirror to get the glare to, for aircraft to notice where you are. Well, enemy aircraft could very easily see the glare from glass. So the first thing the troops did when they were in a combat zone was to lower the yeah. screen down onto the hood, onto the bonnet. And then they would also supply a canvas, effectively a canvas cover to go over the glass, not really to protect the glass from damage, but stop it from Reflecting. flashing back up to the troops, Smart. Up, up to the aircraft, yeah. So we wanted a very low profile, front and rear and to the sides, and also, a lot of these vehicles were transported by military cargo plane and so oh. there was a desire to keep them small. You had to make them as small as possible. Transportable. Transportable, yeah. Because yeah. you've got to get them. Remember, the idea was that these would be made for the uh, D-Day invasions in June of 44. So if we lift the hood up, if we lift the bonnet up and look here, you can see the engine and the transmission and everything is serviceable, it's small, it's compact. You have access to spark plugs right away. Spark plugs on the top, the distributor is here, points of condenser ignition, it's six volts, but that was standard at the time. Yeah, yeah. One of the later modifications, conversions to these Jeeps would be to make them 12 volts to more contemporary um, electronics. Right. Um, but this Jeep, thankfully, has been restored exactly as it was built, exactly as it left the factory. And so it's on six volt system. The fuel, the fuel filter is here at the top. The generator is easy to get to. The oil filter is mounted in here. Right, so everything that you need to service or access is like right you there. You should be able to get to it immediately. There again. isn't any BMW compartmentalized, yeah. very hidden thing. It's all right there. And if you need to take the fenders off, if you want to get down, like the, the whole front of the Jeep will come apart very easily. The whole Jeep actually will fall apart very easily, deliberately so. Right. Just okay. a handful of bolts on the grill, the front grill and the front fenders will come away. The hood bonnet is just held on with half a dozen bolts. That would come out of the way. And the whole bodywork, I think, is held on with perhaps 12 bolts, and you can pull the whole bodywork off the frame. Yeah. Done that way, so again, if you're under fire, you want to make sure this thing can be serviced as fast as possible, as easy as possible, without any problems. So that was the reason for doing that. Wow, so yeah. cool. 
Oh, all this stuff here that I'm seeing, like for example, the drive belt, I'm assuming that this, what is this bracketry for? Is this to be able to change it on the on site? That's exactly right. If, yeah? you, if you look here, look, there's a little handle to be able to pull uh, uh, the belt, pull the old, pull the generator, not an alternator. Pull oh, and the you generator. release the tension from the belt. Yes, and, and the explanation I've heard for that is twofold. Not merely because that would make it easy to change the fan belt in the field at midnight in the rain under enemy fire, but also when the troops needed to ford rivers, you didn't want the fan belt to be um, working the oh, fan splashing itself and water. Sp splashing water onto the electronics. Oh. So when the troops were driving through rivers, fording as they say, disconnect. disconnect it, that would stop the fan running, that would keep the water down and hopefully prevent a lot of the electronics which is very basic electronics at the time. Right. Remember, this is 1942. It's uh, nearly 80 years old. It'll be 80 years old next year. So it's very fundamental in, in its design and construction. Yeah, but and then looking at the carburetor, looking at all the height of that, it's placed as high as it can be so that it can for, for exactly do water ingress, reason. waking as yeah, high as it can yeah, be. Yeah, they had to be um, as serviceable as possible, as reliable as possible. As and many terrains as they could cross that's as right, possible. That's yeah. exactly right. Um, I talked to a gentleman called George Baxter from Army Jeep Parts, who in my opinion is perhaps the world's leading expert on oh, Jeeps. So, so that is the go-to person for these vehicles. Yes, e extremely kind, extremely professional, and um, I'm sure you know if anybody wanted any help or advice or guidance on Jeeps, he'd be the guy to get to. The, the, the internet's our friend with all of that, so if you right. look for George Baxter's name, he was, he, his name will come up. Uh, uh, you know, if, if I wanted to discuss Formula One engineering, I would perhaps talk to Ross Braun, who was my former technical director at Benetton, because I believe he's the world expert in Formula One technology and strategy. But George, but George is the Baxter is the Jeep for this. The Jeep expert, in, in my opinion, there's no there's no doubt about that. So his advice was uh, was was very key and helpful to me when I was searching for the correct Jeep to buy. Yeah. And I gotta ask you, how did you come from being someone that loves these vehicles to ever wanting to own it? I mean, as a kid, we all start playing with toy cars, right. maybe, video games, maybe, but here you are as an adult and now you have your own yeah. sort of toy. It's, real well, real life, real Like function. you, you know, I, I've always been fascinated with them. I, I've always liked the story of the Jeep. Um, there is a story, whether it's lore or legend or fact, that Enzo Ferrari, when he was first introduced to the Ford GPW and the Willys MBJ Jeeps, he said, that is America's first true sports car. Yeah. <laughs> what a yeah. stinger. What, what a thing to say. So, <laughs> you know, and, but when you, again, Enzo was a mechanic and a machinist by trade and he could see immediately when he looked around it, what an in, incredible design it is. Absolutely perfectly designed for what it's supposed to be. Here's, I'll tell you one little extra secret about this car, about this Jeep that just highlights that. The headlights here, are designed, if you look, there's a little wing nut down here on both sides of the car. It looks like a swivel from yep. here. It's a little pivot here and they are designed so that, again, if you're at night and you need to be repairing the car, I know repairing where we're the going Jeep, with this. you can, you can you tilt it You have your own over. lights so you, you can work on it. You have lights shining on the Jeep to be able to work on it. Isn't that a cool feature? Well, besides the modular construction of everything, yeah. I know everything is function built, but I see random things I have so many questions about. I, I mean, I can see that the glass goes up, so yeah. it becomes sort of like the way that you get air inside uh, the cabin, so to speak. I see that the windshield comes down. Yeah. I see the convertible frame, but I see handles here. And what are these handles doing here? I, it's not helping me get in, because I don't need that. Well, there's two reasons for them to be there. One is the, the, the grab handles are designed, so they'll help you to lift the body off if you need to get the body the off. The body off. Right, remember, just lift it straight up off the frame when you take the mounting bolts out. Um, but also, remember these Jeeps had to go everywhere. And so if it got bogged down in the mud, they're four wheel drive, but if oh. it was bogged down in the mud, you need your, your, your teammates. Your, your, your guys, grab a handle. Grab a handle and pull it up. Let's do it. Let's get moving. And also, you know, guys would hang kit bags off here. They would hang all sorts of stuff, water bottles and spades and extra uh, equipment. Anything would be, would be put onto those handles. But that's the original idea to my understanding is two reasons. One, simply to lift it off and to get the Jeep moving again. Yeah, wow, the fuel cool. tank is not mounted underneath the car. Yeah, like in modern cars, you're right. thinking safety, you're thinking back there. 
The driver was actually sitting right on top of the fuel tank, and if you look here, oh my God, here's the here's the seat. <laughs> Clearly for the driver, the seat squab at the bottom. But if you lift it up, oh, here's the filler for the tank, and, and that's the, the fuel pump. And there's the yeah, there's the um, the fuel gauge, but this is the tank. So what could possibly go wrong with that in a combat situation? Well, the these guys weren't smoking in during war or anything. <laughs> So, so there it is. So again, this is again. I must say, it's a it's a Willys design, not particularly a Ford design. Ford put their own little touches to it, but it's a Willys design. But they made they wanted to make sure they got the best use of every square inch of space. So we'd have uh, luggage compartments at the back here. There's not much, but there would be luggage compartments at the back, left and right, to put tools in. The rear seat just folds down here. Steve, also Ford stamped everywhere. Ford stamped everywhere. The, the little yeah. F everywhere. Yeah. 80 years later, the People folks still wanted to restore them to hold that piece of military history. And again, the military generals at the time have said that one of the reasons that the Second World War was won in as short a time as it was after, Norm after the invasion of Normandy on June the 6th was because of the Jeep. It made a massive difference. But it allowed troops to move through almost any terrain as swiftly as possible. Now, I've worked on all sorts of things throughout my 40-year career in the automotive industry. And as we're mentioning, I've worked for Marinello, I've, I've done Ferrari restoration work. I've been <laughs> fortunate enough to be a part of a team with Michael Schumacher and Ross Braun that won three Formula One World Championships. And that's wonderful to be around all that highly sophisticated engineering. But going back full circle where we started our conversation, it is the design and the passion that really inspires me. Very, very, very few changes happened to this design from the original production, from the, from the Willys MA, which became the MB, to this car, to yeah. this Jeep, hardly anything changed. It's the beginning of they, an American icon. They had it right, yeah. yeah. And then, as you know, the Jeep legend and story has gone on forever since then. 80 years later, Jeeps are still selling very strong, but the Jeep legend all started right here because Uncle Sam needed a military vehicle for the Second World War. Wonderful.